Hello friends, this is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN merch button click on that it'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that hey on the swag that i'm using it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear sports history network and my favorite podcaster the sports history network store shop there today this podcast is part of the sports history network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport you can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com Hi folks, Uh, welcome to another episode of Pro Football in the 1970s. I'm your host, Joe Zagorski, and tonight we're talking about the decade's coaching carousel. Now, perhaps no other era in the sport of pro football has seen the renewing and regurgitation of head coaches quite as much as what we are witnessing in this current era, 2022, so to speak. It seems that when a head coach gets fired in this century, His next opportunity to wear a headset on the sidelines is just around the corner. But did you know that during the 1970s, head coaches were moving around from team to team almost as often? It's true. This episode of Pro Football in the 1970s does not necessarily contain the best head coaches to go from one team to another during that decade, but it does contain uh, the most noteworthy head coaches who traded one team's colors for another. Well, let's start at the very beginning of the 70s, at the pinnacle of victory, which was simply put as winning the Super Bowl. In 1970, Don McCafferty took over for Don Shula in Baltimore, and in the span of six months, McCafferty hoisted the Vince Lombardi Trophy for his Colts' 16-13 win over Dallas in Super Bowl V. Now, McCafferty's good graces in Baltimore did not last long, however. Before the end of the 1972 season, he was fired for not benching future Hall of Fame quarterback Johnny Unitas. The following year, McCafferty was hired by the Detroit Lions to be their head coach. Let's face it, when you win a Super Bowl as a head coach, you practically will have employment for at least, oh, at least as as an assistant coach for a very long time. Sadly, McCafferty died shortly before beginning the 1974 NFL season, so he never got to see the fruits of his labors really past Super Bowl V. But another Super Bowl winning head coach also got a second chance in the decade of the 1970s. Hank Stram was the only head coach that the Dallas Texans slash Kansas City Chiefs ever had known from their inception in 1960 until his final season with the team in 1974. He also had a victory in Super Bowl IV to his name, but he was fired after that turbulent season of 1974. Then he went to work as a color commentator for CBS football games in 1975. By 1976, however, Stram was named the new head coach for the New Orleans Saints. Now, he could not produce a similar winning record for the Saints that he did for the Chiefs, but few people actually thought that he could turn things around on Bourbon Street anyway. Uh, One coach who also managed to land on his feet with another team during the 1970s was none other than Don Coriel. Almost immediately that he came on the pro scene to the St. Louis Cardinals, Coriel got a couple of reputations. One, as a miracle worker, turning turning forlorn franchises into successful ones, his other reputation might be one that will eventually earn him a bust in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, that of being an early proponent of the pro passing game. He used ideas that were seen in Bill Walsh's West Coast offense, and he blended those strategies with the utilization of the game-breaking talents in his offensive lineup in St. Louis, namely setback Terry Metcalf and wide receiver Mel Gray. Almost out of nowhere, his Cardinals went from a mediocre team in 1973 to a 10-4 division championship in 1974. 
Then in 1975, Coriel's Cardinals repeated as NFC Eastern Division champions. Unfortunately for Coriel, a stay in St. Louis was nearing its end when the Cardinals failed to make the playoffs in 1976 and 1977. The Cards were one of those teams where the ownership was not very patient, and the result of that impatient usually meant that the head coach was sent packing. But Coriel did not stay without a team that long. In 1978, he was offered the head coaching job at San Diego during the second half of that season. There, with the Chargers, Coriel would take his pass-happy offense to the heights of pro football offenses as the decade drew to a close. The Chargers put up an impressive 4,138 passing yards through the air in 1979, a statistic which led the league. The head coach who began the 1978 season for the Chargers was none other than Tommy Prothrow, whose very first pro coaching job after many years as a college head coach was with the Los Angeles Rams back in 1971. Prothrow was also the victim of an impatient owner or two, or three. He lasted two years in Los Angeles before he was dismissed without cause. In 1973, Prothrow was signed to be the head coach of the San Diego Chargers. Then in 1979, after five whole months away from the pro game, Prothrow was signed by Cleveland to be their player personnel director. It just seemed that there was always a spot available for anyone who used to be a head coach in the NFL. Now There are undoubtedly many more former NFL head coaches in the 1970s who were recycled to become a head coach again for another pro football club. Sometimes an assistant coach for a successful team gets a chance to become a head coach for another team. Then upon failing as a head coach, he returns to his original team as an assistant coach again. A case in point is former Miami Dolphins assistant coach Bill Arnsparger, who became the head coach of the New York Giants in 1974. Within a few years, he was back in Miami working for his old boss, Don Shula, once again in his same old job on the defense. This recycling carousel of coaches has been going on for years, and it is still going on in this present day. I'd like to uh, let people know that we're not going to have a trivia question tonight, but I wanted to thank all of you for tuning into this episode of Pro Football in the 1970s. Please be sure, loyal listeners, to check out my previous episodes of Pro Football in the 1970s on YouTube. Also, please continue to listen to the Sports History Network, which besides my podcast, you'll also hear a variety of podcasts on many different aspects of football history, as well as podcasts on baseball, basketball, hockey, and several other sports. You'll be able to hear a virtual cornucopia of sports listening programs on the Sports History Network. Till our next episode on Pro Football in the 1970s, thanks for joining in on this episode, folks. Take care and enjoy the current football season. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com.
You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.